Coming up on this week in Linux, we take a look at some browser releases, a new crowdfunding project for socializing the command line. In distro news, there are quite a few releases and even some pioneering happening this week. Linux hardware has saw some good, bad, and ugly news. Then we'll check out what is new in the Linux gaming. All that and more coming up. I'm Michael Tanel with Tux Digital, bringing you your weekly source for Linux good news. Up first in app news this week, Cubzilla released version 2.2, which will be the last major version released before the switch to focusing on Falcon. After this release, Cubzilla will only be offering bug fixes, bug fixes and maintenance. This release added a session manager, improved location bar completer with search suggestions, and various improvements in, tab man in the tab manager extension. Cube Browser is a cross-platform keyboard-driven browser with a Vim-like minimalistic interface. Version 1.0.1 .1 of Cute Browser was released this week, and it comes with b many big breaking changes. Most notably, the new configuration and system and the switching to uh, Qt web, in web Engine instead of WebKit. This week I found a really cool project called OpenCV Playing Card Detector. This is an open source Python program that uses OpenCV to detect and identify play cards from a Pi camera video feed on a Raspberry Pi. The developer released the code on GitHub, and the developer says he is doing it to make a blackjack playing robot, but instead, maybe in addition to that, or just instead, I hope he uses it to set up something like Twitch Plays Blackjack. This week, the Linux Foundation launches the mess Open Messaging Project. According to the project announcement, the goal of the project is to provide a vendor-neutral open standard for distributed messaging. That isn't that descriptive, but it's actually kind of difficult to explain what it is in a short snippet. The Open Messaging Project is intended to be a more efficient replacement for the Java Messaging Service, or JMS. It's basically an agnostic server-to-server -server data sending system. If you are interested in learning more, then I suggest looking up some articles on Java Messaging Service, as that's been around for a while, so there'll be a lot more sources that explain it. Borg Backup released version 1.1 this week. If you're unfamiliar with Borg Backup, it is a deduplicating command line backup program. The main goal of the of Borg is to provide an efficient and a secure way to backup data. The data de deduplication technique used makes Borg suitable for daily backups since it only stores, is, stores changed items. So it's like a transactional backup. The authenticated encryption technique makes it suitable for backups that to not fully to use on not fully trusted targets, maybe like Dropbox, for example. Borg uses tried and tested co compression algorithms like LZ4 and encryption like 256-bit AES. So let's stay on the command line for a little bit for the next news item, and that is a new crowdfunding campaign aimed at adding a social community feature directly into the Linux command line. ZekiHub wants to be a social repository where you can discover thousands of examples and interfaces contributed from users all around the world. The idea behind ZekiHub is to create a social platform where any Zeki user can share a command they created for others to use. If you'd like to learn more about that, then check out their Kickstarter page linked in the show notes. Speaking of crowdfunding, this episode is brought to you by the Linux is Everywhere shirt. It's a shirt I made to celebrate the proliferation of Linux. The concept of the design has Tux blended into the background to convey the message, even if you aren't aware that Linux is there, it probably is. The shirt is available for shipping from North America and from Europe. In distro news this week, Chakra GNU slash Linux released version 2017.10. This release was codenamed Girdle. Chakra GNU slash Linux is a distribution with a half rolling release model and an emphasis on KDE and Qt technologies. This release is a maintenance snapshot release with many upgrades including Plasma 5.10.5 and the Linux kernel 4.12.4. Next up in the news is Q4OS 2.4 Scorpion. It was released this week as a long-term support LTS release to be supported for at least five years with security patches and software updates. Q4OS is a distro using the Trinity desktop environment, which is a fork of the KDE 3.5 code base. Q4OS Scorpion is based on Debian Stretch 9.2, Trinity 14.0.5, and it is available for 64-bit and 32-bit machines. The team over at Elementary OS were interviewed this week by Canonical Sarah Dickinson about upcoming integration of Snap packages into their infrastructure. 
In the interview, the elementary devs revealed the fact that they are going to be implementing Ubuntu Snappy technologies to provide their users with a modern and secure confined app format. To quote the developers, the confinement that Snaps offer provides an extra layer of security. And confinement means that we don't have to spend a lot of time performing a security audit in order for developers to do this. We can both save time reviewing and keep our users safe. I think this is a great piece of news, and I'm very happy that other distros are adopting the Snap ecosystem because it's got a ton of potential. And the more people, the more distros do this, the the better, even better it's going to be. Endless Computers announced this week on their Twitter account that Endless OS has recently become the first GNU slash Linux distribution to enable support for Flatpak apps from FlatHub by default with this latest release. Starting with version 3.2.5, the Endless OS release will have support for installing Flatpak apps from the FlatHub repository by default. Endless isn't the only distro to announce some pioneering decisions this week. Ubuntu Mate announced that 17.10 will be the first distro with pre-installed Snap support by being the first to ship a Snap by default with Pulse Mixer. I used Pulse Mixer recently and it's actually pretty cool. It's basically like a command line version of Pulse Audio. Actually, Pulse, Pulse Audio Volume Control or Pavu Control. What's really cool is that you can connect it to a drop down terminal and activate things with your mouse while still being able to use the keyboard in the terminal. That is pretty awesome. Ubuntu 1710 Artful Aardvark has entered the final freeze period in preparation for the official release of Ubuntu 1710 in just a few days. Ubuntu 1710 is scheduled for release this coming Thursday, October 19th. KDE celebrated their 21st birthday this week with a lot of new releases. As well as discussed, as we discussed last week, Plasma 5.11 was released this week with a lot of new features and bug fixes. The most interesting thing for me would have to be the return of the notification history system. KDE also released a lot of application updates for Dolphin, Ocular, Gwynview, Caden Live, and many more. KDE Neon was the first distro to release support for Plasma 5.11 within just a few hours of the announcement. Maybe even less than that. Arch Linux and OpenSUSE Tumbleweed were not very far behind as they also released support this week for the new version. To learn more about Plasma 5.11, check out the promo video that I made for the project, for the KDE project, and the link is in the show notes. In Linux hardware news, Purism's Librem 5 security and privacy focused smartphone was successfully crowdfunded this week and it has even passed its goal of 1.5 million with over 1.7 million as of this recording and still has seven days left to go. Oh, eight days. Well, it's seven days and change then. Either way. I'm looking forward to the eventual release of this device in 2019. In the intro to this week's show, I mentioned that we had the good, the good news, the bad, and the ugly news in hardware this week. The Librem 5 was certainly the good news. This next item covers both the bad and the ugly. This week, a new Pi Top was released, with the biggest feature being a new patented cooling system. The ugly portion of the news is probably obvious, however the bad part might not be. The Pi Top was, su- was a successful crowdfunding campaign on Indiegogo, but is yet to ever actually fulfill their campaign promises. The Pi Top claimed that it would help you learn to make a printed, cir- printed circuit boards, starting with 3D printing for creating real hardware products. This campaign promised to create an open project by releasing 3D assets so anyone with access to a 3D printer could make their own pie top. And as of today, they have yet to release anything at all in respect to that promise. Pie top became a proprietary product and with their announcement of this patented cooling system, I think it is safe to say that they have no intention of ever making good on that promise. If bad and ugly wasn't enough, the pie top is even worse because the pie stop kit sells for $320, which of course is ridiculous. You can get a pretty decent actual laptop for that kind of money. Let's move on to some really cool news. The European Union pledged this week to support open source government solutions. The, I'm going to butcher this, the Tallinn the Talon Declaration on e-government states that European governments will make more use of open source solutions and open standards when building ICT systems and solutions for many reasons, including to avoid vendor lock-ins. The 2017 Libra Office Conference event kicked off this week in Rome, Italy, with a focus on the development for the next major release of LibreOffice Suite. 
LibreOffice Office Suite. That's LibreOffice version 6.0 is tentatively scheduled for the release next year in early February. Up first this week in Linux Gaming, Solus announced that they will be creating a base snap of their Linux Steam integration. Since the moment Solus announced that they will be implementing full snap support in their distro, I've been hoping for something news like this to become a thing. So it's quite awesome to see it started. The Solus team says they are hoping to relieve the pressure on distributions for supporting gaming. The snapped LSI will ensure that the Steam slash LSI combo would work identically on every distribution, even if they don't support multi-libs. This takes all of the Solus gaming Steam work and provides it for everyone on any distro with reliable updates. I think this is an incredibly exciting news and I can't wait for this to come to fruition. Next up in the news, Humble Bundle announced that they have been acquired by the media site IGN. It's hard to tell whether this will be a good thing or not, but due to the current reputation for IGN in the industry, it's somewhat unsettling. Humble co-founder John Graham and IGN executive vice president Mitch Galbraith discussed the acquisition with Game of Sutra today, with Galbraith stating, it's not bro- if it's not broken, don't fix it. But following that, Graham said, we want to stick to the fundamentals in the short term. For me, and probably many others, what is unsettling is the part where he says short term. The proper humble indie bundles that started it all have been very rare as of late, and with this acquisition, I fear that they may even be gone. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Now let's talk about some recent game releases. The helicopter combat game Helleborn has left early access and is now officially released. Their Steam page description says, Get behind the cockpits of the best helicopters in the world, from the classic machines of 1950s to the modern gunships of the 21st century. This sounds pretty fun, actually, so I'm going to have to give this a try. Sinker is a minimalistic puzzle game using various contraptions to sink pucks. The responsive ambient music is also a nice touch. This game seems to take about two hours to complete, and for just one dollar, that's not bad. And it also looks, it looks like if you look through the the different examples, it can get pretty complicated, so it's not like just a basic, simple game. It's a, it looks, it looks pretty challenging after, I mean, when you get to the, like, the higher levels. Monsters in Medicine is a turn-based puzzle game about building a hospital for injured monsters. This game recently released with full Linux support, and it's so quirky, I just had to include it in the show. Forgotten Lore is a free trading card game with Linux support. Players can make and submit their own cards to get accepted into the to get accepted into the game, and the cards you earn in the game can or be used outside uh, of the game in the Steam market. So you could sell and sell cards and stuff. So you, it's the the, the economy of the game is controlled by the players. Last but not least this week, we have Argentum Age, which is a, another collectible card game, but the twist with this one is that it's completely open source. In fact, there aren't any microtransactions or anything, so that's refreshing. It's worth noting that Argentum Age isn't available on Steam, so you'll need to download the game from their website. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on this show, please hit that like button and be sure to subscribe. If you'd like to support the channel, we have a Patreon at patreon.com slash tuxdigital, or you can order the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt by going to tuxdigital.com slash Linux is Everywhere. Just a reminder, the show is live every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern, so join us in the live chat or in Discord to discuss this week's Linux news. Thanks for watching. I'm Michael Tunnell with Tux Digital, and as always, keep using, learning, and enjoying Linux. Bam. That would be a completion of the recording sections. Blam. Blam. Or, as we say, savage. <laughs>